Great, thanks so much, Chloe. Um, uh, panelists, feel free to, to turn on your, your video. I am um, not going to be very long here. Um, I just want to, to thank everyone for joining us today. I am Jennifer Gibson. I'm the head of open research communication at eLife and chair of OWASPA. I'm very much looking forward to our conversations this week. We have just the perfect follow on to our starting keynote with Professor Tamwine, uh, co-organized by our colleague Leslie Chan and myself, although I don't hesitate to say that I've really been in a supporting role here and have learned a great deal in, in working with, with Leslie this time around. So Leslie, thank you from me as well. Our ambition now is to help share more uh, perspectives to try and help in, enrich each of our own worldviews and to identify opportunities for two way collaborations. Again, as, as Dr. Tumwine said, um, we live in a global village, so uh, this is a chance to get to know some more of our fellow villagers. We've got four uh, fantastic presenters who I will ask to introduce themselves in, in just a moment. As usual, uh, the format for our extended opening discussion is more conversational. So I'm going to ask each of the presenters to address two questions, and then we will open up the floor uh, for an exchange between the presenters and with you all. As Chloe said, your, your questions are very welcome in the Q&A box, which will help us to find them more quickly. And Claire Redhead has generously offered to help me moderate the questions. So, so Claire, thanks in advance for that. Okay, so um, let's get started. So I'm going to uh, address the question to Susie first of all, and then we'll ask uh, Ibrahim and then Tim and then and then Fernanda to to comment. So Susie, feels like Jeopardy a little bit, doesn't it? So Susie, what I what I'd like uh, to what I'd like you to tell us first is, um, can you know who you are, uh, what your role is, um, the the scope of your work, and and the key messages um, for for this audience. Um, with respect to, to what you do and the, the focus of our conversation today. So, so five minutes are over to you, Susie. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. I'm Susan Skomal, President and CEO of BioOne for the past 16 years. This has been a period of intense experimentation, change, reevaluation, and further adaptation. We are, our middle name is, among other things, flexibility. Importantly, I could not do the job I do without the support of an excellent team. That has been the strength of BioOne, along with all the participants and those that uh, work with us. I am privileged to serve the international community of bioscientists. That would be anything where you can see the organism as opposed to with a with the naked eye as opposed to with a really high powered microscope they, we our scientists study everything from beetles and bats to bromeliads and bears and we can't forget the moss mushrooms and mollusks bio one does not own or manage any of the journals that are part of the our uh, participating collection of journals. Thus, we do not manage their business affairs. It's been a daily challenge to meet the needs equally of the publishers and which are societies and universities and uh, uh, institutes and the research libraries and their patrons. So it's an equal um, an, an equal concern on the part of Bio One and, and everything we do to meet the needs of both communities. And through partnerships with as many not-for-profits as possible, Bio One provides economies of scale for services such as, beginning with the PDF, we convert, add functionality, including DOIs, JATs, XML, et cetera. We host on a first-class not-for-profit platform we distribute our sales of Bio One Complete, which is a sub subscribed collection of about 215 journals. And we have a Bio One Open Access, which contains 33 gold OA titles, which has a different model. 
We manage sales for the subscription subscribe collection, and we enhance discoverability and indexing in every possible way we can. We preserve and archive. We provide copyright clearance center and pay-per-view services on behalf of our titles. Uh, we also do a lot of promotion, which includes an ambassador award where we give a $1,000 award to a young scholar who has been able to, to convincingly turn their very academic work into plain English and thereby reach a greater audience. We participate in developing nations programs such as Research for Life and Following on our excellent keynote speaker, I did check in to find that we have 129 articles by Ugandan authors, 40 of which are presented as, or 31%, are presented as open access on the, on the platform. So what makes BioOne a not-for-profit, you might ask? Our mission has been to return meaningful royalties to the subscribed titles, and thus far we've returned $50 million, which is one heck of a lot of money for a very um, close-knit and reasonably underfunded community of scholarship. We keep the subscription prices as low as absolutely possible for subscribers. We, we provide tiered pricing, discounts, consortial deals, we also provide an affordable home for open access journals. The first journal, by the way, open access, was added in 2001, the year that we launched. And we, in my opinion, we are an original form of a transformational deal. So it's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you so far. Super. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Um, Ibrahim, may I hand it over to you, please? Uh, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Oanda. I work for Cotesria. Cotesria is the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, uh, headquartered in uh, Dakar, Senegal. Uh, Pan African Social Science and Humanities, uh, you know, Council, founded uh, uh, about for seven years ago. Uh, with the vision that uh, can be summarized as trying to uh, fight the fragmentation of African academics, uh, but at the same time, I'm sure that uh, uh, African academics are not isolated from direct debates uh, at the global level uh, in terms of uh, what has been happening in the social sciences. And the uh, has has tried to do this in three ways. First of all, we have uh, a research program uh, that funds research for emerging academics in African universities, doctoral students, uh, you know, young academics, uh, so as to give me a chance, especially at the postdoctoral level, uh, you know, to uh, to uh, you know to improve their skills in terms of field work in the social science, sciences, uh, humanities, and the uh, rate uh, higher education studies. Uh, secondly, we have a training and a grants program, which I had, I had the training and the grants program of the council. And this is kind of uh, a research uh, training uh, program uh, that targets at training, uh, you know, skilling uh, emerging researchers in the continent with the right kind of methodologies and frameworks. Uh, that they need to undertake research and produce high quality knowledge uh, that is relevant to African needs. Uh, we do conduct uh, academic writing and publication workshops across the continent, uh, open confined uh, uh, regional you know, settings. Uh, we do also uh, convene workshops that are aimed at, uh, you know, uh, inducting academics in uh, thematic issues in the social science and humanities. And lastly, is the uh, publication and dissemination uh, program of the council, uh, which I have been overseeing for the last one year. The substantive director of that program lived and uh, 
because of the complexities of COVID, we have not been able to recruit, but I've been overseeing the operations of that program. Uh, we operate two in-house channels, and the work that we publish in these channels is derived from the research that we support. Uh, we have been running African development, which I think has been the longest learning uh, social science channel uh, in the continent, uh, and also the channel for higher education in Africa. These are the in-house channels that we run. Uh, but then we also support uh, disciplinary associations uh, in the continent uh, through the channels that they produce, the African Sociological Review, uh, African Samani, which has been, uh, you know, the channel for African historians. Uh, at some point, we were supporting uh, the African anthropologists, which is uh, uh, a channel uh, of African anthropologists, uh, through a center in in Addis Ababa and uh, Algeria. Uh, we run the African Media Review, uh, which kind of uh, tries to uh, highlight issues in the humanities. Uh, and 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 we do try to support uh, some of these works to be translated both in French uh, and in Arabic to make sure that they reach a wider audience. We also have uh, a book series, and these books are produced from uh, you know our thematic institutes. But we do also publish what we call unsolicited manuscripts. These are manuscripts from senior academics which are not part of our programs, but that we uh, we process. Uh, we do support, uh, as I said, disciplinary associations, but also uh, doctoral schools in universities, uh, you know, to make sure that we support them in uh, uh, workshops and uh, similar convenings, uh, so as to better prepare uh, emerging academics into the world of academic publications and so forth. Now, all of the work that we produce uh, throughout the history of the council is freely downloadable uh, from our website. Uh, we don't judge academics anything. We support them to come to our convenings. Uh, we make sure that we support them uh, and their, their work uh, is published in what uh, can be said to be a kind of high level uh, in terms of the quality of that work. Uh, and we disseminate this uh, freely. Uh, and this was the overall vision uh, you know, that uh, that led to the establishment of the council. Make sure that, uh, you know, African academics are not isolated in uh, instances where, you know, uh, gatekeeping uh, prevented African academics from uh, publishing in channels out of the continent. Uh, those who founded the council thought that they give African academics an opportunity uh, of publishing their work and then starting their debates into global direct engagements on and about Africa. That's all. Super, thanks so much, Ibrahim. Tim, Tim, over to you, please. Uh, hi, thanks, Jennifer. And first of all, I just want to say uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to be on this panel. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be, be speaking with you today and about a topic that I'm really passionate about. So. Uh, I'll try to contain that passion so it's not too uh, not too uh, indecipherable. But basically, uh, who am I? I'm uh, Tim Wilson. I'm the um, Associate Vice President of Research Programs at the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council in Canada. So we're the federal uh, granting agency uh, uh, mandated to uh, support social sciences and humanities research and uh, talent development. So we fund programs uh, such as scholarships and fellowships programs for students, research grants programs for, for investigator-led research, um, research partnerships programs for those undertaking community-based research or research in partnership with government and industry. And uh, when it comes to open access, I like to think of uh, about four, four points of intervention that we have. Uh, with respect to trying to advance that agenda. Um, first of all, there's through our funded researchers. So we have, uh, as many funders do, we have a, an open access policy that, that uh, requires our funded researchers to publish their uh, research findings uh, that, are, that are the result of uh, a research grant. 
requires them to publish it in, in an open access format. Um, hopefully we get a chance to talk a bit about, about it further, but uh, one, one issue we're finding with that is compliance is a, is a real issue. So uh, in terms of uh, the, the extent to which our funded research researchers actually are publishing open access is it, it could be better. Um, our, our second point of intervention, I would say, is, is through the incentives built into our own processes, namely peer review. So, so as an agency, along with the other granting agencies here in Canada, so there's a, an agency for health research, there's also an agency for natural sciences and engineering. So we all signed on to the San Francisco Declaration on, on Research Assessment, and, and we're ensuring, of course, that there's, there's no perverse incentives within our, our, our peer review. Uh, criteria that uh, that are used by by the peer reviewers, but um, I would say that's kind of a, a the negative approach, making sure there's no there's no uh, let's say uh, there's no uh, incentives to use uh, journal impact factors, those types of things. But uh, we we haven't yet looked at whether or not there are positive incentives within the peer review process to award reward or um, open access or other forms of dissemination so so it's something that uh, uh, in in an ideal world if we're imagining the future as per the title of this of this we we could imagine in the future um, a third point of intervention that we have um, unlike our, our sister agencies in Canada it are direct programs to support dissemination so we have a program to support uh, journals um, and we have a program that supports uh, scholarly monographs um, and and there again there's I think that direct support has has ensured that it, it, in Canada there's especially with respect to the journals there's a, a real diverse ecosystem of, of a lot of small journals that are they're that able to to get by because of some federal funding but because we have that diverse ecosystem um, there are also some limitations to let's say um, uh, economies of scale, whether or not they're able to innovate, adapt, try to try to, to uh, uh, improve uh, everything from discoverability to to uh, adapting to new new trends uh, uh, on on dissemination. Um, and then the fourth point of intervention is, I guess I would say in light of that last point with respect to that there's a lot of a lot of these journals that are, that have uh, let's say limited resources we've recently started to uh, directly fund um, platforms uh, well one platform so uh, we've started to fund uh, in Canada it's called Coalition Publica it's a it's a partnership between ARUD which is a, a dissemination platform similar to Bio One, which uh, Provide you know a non-commercial uh, platform that uh, that provides dissemination services for for uh, Canadian journals, and it's a partnership between that and uh, Public Knowledge Project uh, that that uh, that uh, offers the open journal software. So uh, so it's uh, I'm a real big fan of the work that they're doing, and our support's aimed to help them um, onboard more. Canadian journals in an open access format in, in a way that that can sustain their operations. So I'd say, um, let's say the kind of short form view that I that I see in Canada would be uh, that funder mandates for open access are important, but compliance is a real issue. I'd say that the um, government funding of journals can enhance you know a, a lively diverse ecosystem i think linguistic diversity has has helped the canadian context as well in terms of um let's say decreasing the the desirability of large commercial publishers to absorb uh, a, a critical threshold of our, our journals um and then finally I think support for open infrastructure is absolutely crucial, but it's obviously costly and can be complex. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. And Fernanda. Fernanda, apologies. Thank you, Jennifer. And I'm very glad to be here with 
the colleagues in this panel, and especially to be here in Oasta with all the editors and the librarians, which is a, a really important audience for me and, and, and to participate in this dialogue with you. And well, I am a researcher at CONICET, which is the National Council for Research in Argentina, and I am the director of the Research Center on the Circulation of Knowledge, which is based in a small province in Argentina, which is called Mendoza. And I've been the chair of the Advisory Committee on Open Science for the UNESCO recommendation on open science since mid-2020. <laughs> that, that's like a year and a half ago. And well, my research focus on the last maybe 20 years is in, in, two, in two paths. First of all, in sociology of science, I'm interested in uh, observing empirically what's the role of academic publishing in the building of, of the academic prestige, and especially what type of circuits of the publications we have in the non-hegemonic countries that such as Latin American circuit, which is my specific focus of research. And I'm also working on, on these last 20 years on the evaluative, evaluative cultures, evaluative policies. I'm interested in research assessment. I think that incentives for open science and, and open access in publishing is like the most important things to change practices and, and cultures, right? And um, in, in what concerns open science, which is one of my main concerns now, I think that the, the global academic interest and public will towards open science was accelerated in the last year, year and a half with the sanitary emergency that we're living. But I think that the pandemic of COVID also proved us that uh, worldwide, I mean, that the urgency was to make truth this idea of a, of a right to, to science, as to, to progress in science, this uh, human right was imposed uh, supposedly since the 1948 declaration, but we are, are seeing how this is not really a reality and we, we would like to work towards that. So I think that uh, the open science movement is really a, a key piece to enhance scientific collaboration and to respond to these type of global emergencies. But how do we do that? I mean, the recommendation for open science at UNESCO has uh, already worked in the direction of helping to, to create a global consensus. And we, we've seen that we have like five key pillars and we have a, an important text there that, that can help to build this consensus. However, my main concern is that if we want to advance towards open science and the open access in publishing, in academic publishing, to adhere to this goal is not really enough. I mean, we have to, to discuss how this transition to open science is to surpass or, or is uh, to, to, to face the challenge of the international uh, digital divide, the asymmetries that we have between hegemonic and non-hegemonic countries, and how, how we can make through this, this real universal access to the benefits of science. And so I think uh, this concern uh, can be seen in like four problems that we have to face here. One of them is this uh, dif difference or asymmetries in digital infrastructures. I think our colleague Ibrahim was talking about some of these issues in Africa and Codestria has made a very important contribution in, in understanding and, and helping to, to discuss this. And then we have the, the increasing article processing charges that is a, a problem that we are facing every day now in, in, in the developed countries. And specifically, I'm, I'm concerned about the commercial route to open science, open access. And the other aspects that are very important in this uh, uh, international asymmetries that we're facing is how can we, uh, with open science, how can we help bibliodiversity and how can we promote multilingualism? And that's, uh, well, I think the, the main aspects of, of my research focus and my concerns. Thank you. And that's just the starting course, everyone. <laughs> we're going to move on to the entree next. So, um, you know, our hope here was to was to bring um, a diversity of, of perspectives and and thanks to those introductions. I think we've, we've accomplished that. Thank you. We, we've, we've heard about um, disciplines. We've heard about infrastructure. We've, we've heard about funding models and relationships with policymakers, um, geographies. It's, it's, it's just 
just great. Thank you. So, um, so let's let's move to the um, to the topic at hand. So, with these perspectives at our disposal, um, we wanted to ask ourselves, you know, how we might. Um, approach scholarly communication afresh. You know, what would we do uh, given the opportunity to um, to imagine a new world for knowledge making and and sharing? So there's so much that we could discuss based on what we've just started with. But let, let's 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 try and explore some some opportunities um, for 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 working together globally. So the next question um, I'm going to ask our presenters um, is this, and I'm going to ask it of Tim and then Fernanda and then Ibrahim and then Susie. So it's a bit more broad. So um, we'd like to hear from each of you um, any, any further thoughts you have on issues and, and challenges in scholarly communication. And then what are the opportunities um, for your, your local or your community's work to be connected to the to global trends. So, um, you know, from my own perspective as a STM a journal based in the UK, um, you know, I, we learn a lot about funder mandates and, and bundled agreements and, and open infrastructure. So, you know, what about, about your perspective? Should, is there an opportunity to connect to the global picture or where, where does it just not click together? What kind of barriers um, might there be that in impeding that connection? And then finally, um, how could your regional or community's perspective inform the global view and, and vice versa? So again, uh, quoting uh, Professor Tamwine, you know, there's an exchange that we want to have place, have take place from each of our perspectives. We have something to share and something to learn. So, so you know, given the audience um, for us here, uh, which is publishing organizations globally, um, but also um, with a concentration in, in the global north, what are, what are the opportunities? So um, I'm glad you had a couple of weeks to think about that because it's a pretty significant task, but, um, but Tim, can I hand it over to you first, please? Thanks. Um, yeah, first of all, I'll just say this is, uh, this is kind of my own personal reflection. So if I, um, if I, if I say things that, that seem outrageous to Canadian researchers, it's not, it's, these are not concrete shirt plans. These are me imagining possibilities, but, um, um, when it comes to, let's say the issue, let's say issues and opportunities, when it comes to the funder mandates that, that you mentioned, I mentioned compliance is low. So I think, um, we looked at, um, <clears throat> we looked at the web of science data and, you know, cross-referenced it with, uh, with, uh, authors that, uh, acknowledged, um, agency support. And we, we figured there's about 40, 46% of our funded authors are, are publishing open access, which is, which is not great. So uh, I think it could be higher uh, at the very least. Um, so uh, I think we need to explore ways to monitor and incentivize uh, compliance to funder mandates. Uh, well, I know in a short context, but probably probably globally uh it's it's an issue um and that connects to other issues that we talked about and when we when we look at okay well how would we do that so how would we track whether or not a researcher published open access and how would we ensure that they have an incentive because the next time they come back to the to the granting trough you know they might be held accountable to that so we would need we would need infrastructure somehow we would need to to have persistent identifiers for our, our researchers for for their for their funded outputs uh, those types of things so so that's how a lot of these issues again are just from the bare surface are are connected the other the other one on there I think is when I, when I talk to researchers at least in Canada there's a real the real cultural component to it you go to to one scholarly association and uh, open access is is let's say it's a no-brainer. It's it's culturally accepted, and then uh, for many of the humanities disciplines, it's seen as more of a challenge. And I know in 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 the natural sciences, there's 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 certain communities and, and cultures within there. There's you know let's say the the uh, the, the chemists uh, might have a different approach to 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 other communities uh, in that in that world as well. 
so I think um, I think when it comes to to ensuring compliance with funder mandates, there's the infrastructure component, there's the incentives of the actual peer review, and of course that culture and awareness that is. I know we've probably been saying this for 20 years at least, but um, it continues to need to be done. Um, I think uh, when it comes to the actual journals themselves, um, the issue uh, there again is, is let's say the diversity of business models, which is let's say a good and a bad thing. Uh, the good thing is ensuring that a thousand flowers are blooming. They're not all relying on one commercial commercial publisher to, to, to generate profits, profitability and uh, to generate uh, the resources for their operations, but it also ensures, as I kind of indicated, that um, there there can be limits to innovation and scale. So um, the other issue I'd point out there is as as we've been encouraging more and more journals that we support to go open app access. Um, it's it's creating a lot of tension with the scholarly associations that rely on the journals for 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 to fund their operations and at least in the Canadian landscape there's not a lot of clarity whose whose role it would be to support the scholarly associations where's that funding coming from so so that's that's a real issue uh, and then when it comes to the the monographs the scholarly monographs um, Again, we've been working with with university presses um, and others to try to figure out how we could start to improve the the amount of those that are open access. And we have real kind of let's say competing um, competing incentives and competing uh, let's say policy objectives between our funding and where we want those scholarly monographs to go and other funding that these university presses get from governments of, of different levels that are giving them culture industry funding where the the funding is geared towards sales because they want a vibrant culture industry so there's it's a real real uh, public policy 101 dilemma of how you square the circle on competing policy objectives um and then uh kind of finally on um i would just say uh on on platforms i would just say the um uh there's a real opportunity, I think, to contribute to a couple of the issues that I mentioned, you know, fund, funder mandates, as well as um, uh, helping journals to uh, benefit from innovations and economies of scale that they wouldn't be able to invest in otherwise. So we, we are trying to build into our programming an incentive for our journals to, to hop onto a non-commercial platform to build in innovation as part of their practices. So I'll stop there. I and. Uh, Happy to discuss further. That's great, Tim. Lots to lots to react to, but I think we're we're going to look for uh, opportunities to react to everyone. I think a, a lot of ideas are going to surface. So, so Fernanda, um, let's let's move to you next. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. I think that in a socially very unequal region such as Latin America, if, if I could speak of my experience in the region. Well, one of the particular features of our region is that science is mainly leaded by public universities and supported by national governments. And so uh, in the last uh, 10 years, we have, for example, three countries with a national law that was passed on the, um, the open access and, and open access repositories. And I've been working and, and following the process of uh, of making these laws reality or implementing them. And it's very difficult because our communities are also like uh, highly divided between the two kinds of elites, the ones that publish in the mainstream journals and, and in this um, style of academic publishing, which is uh, very linked to the impact factor. And uh, all this is, has been like um, an obstacle for open access and the, and the uh, downloading all these production in, in our repositories and this is something that we can see that advances but in a very slow uh, way but it does advance in, in these three countries with the, the national law and open access and uh, also I think that on, on these type of countries with very internationalized we, we also have an elite 
that uh, I call it an elite because it, it also has a lot of uh, symbolic power in our countries, which is uh, more nationalized. It's more related to local circuits and publishing in, in the native languages. And sometimes we think that this mainstream type of publishing is the whole dominant thing, but we also have very important alternative circuits in Latin America. And they are less uh, known, but they exist. And I would like to mention that in, in Latin America, we have an open access movement that is, uh, as many of you know, uh, at work since, uh, I, I would say uh, almost since the 1950s, because the first uh, digital libraries are very old in Latin America. The first experience like the M in, in, in the health uh, issues, but uh, all the, these regional institutes and, and, and libraries that started in, in the 50s and 60s were professionalized with the first indexing databases such as Lit Index and Cielo and Redalic. These were born Lit Index in 1995 and Redalic and Cielo in between 1998 and 2005. And this was also complemented in our region with a regional federation of repositories that was created in 2012, it's called La Referencia, and this is a very important resource that we have in the region for open science and open access. La Referencia collects now repositories from 10 countries, including Portugal and, and Spain, and this federation has uh, collected until now more than 3 million documents. We have a very important uh, uh, amount of uh, documents that come from doctoral and, and and graduate thesis and master degree dissertations. So we have a very important opportunity with this regional infrastructure. And we have seen in the last years, uh, I saw some questions also already about this alternative ways of, of research assessment and publishing. And we have two experiences in our region of what uh, in Europe is called the current uh, research information system, the, the CRIS you know, all the movement around Euro Chris. Well, in Latin America, we have now two experiences, one in Peru and one in Brazil. And this national Chris, I think it's going to be the tendency in Latin America. The national and the regional are two very, very long standing traditions in, in our country. And I, I think we have a real good opportunity to create regional infrastructures. I think that the Norwegian model that is uh, not only in, in Norwich, but also in other of the Scandinavian countries is a very good experience of how we can create new generation repositories with uh, an assessment component, a more qualitative type of assessment for, for publishing and for production, because in the Norwegian uh, Chris, you have all the production included and not only uh, that, that you, you don't, you not, not, not only evaluate the production of the researchers through the international databases such as Scopus or Web Science, you use your own repository with all the production included, and that, that means a way to include all type of production, all type of um, journals, books, reports, proceedings, and you also have all the languages. And so I think that is the new generation repositories that are, we have a very interesting project in core right now is the path to, to improve the ways we evaluate uh, science and especially to improve the way we think on the science impact. I mean, not only in terms of the impact factor, but in terms of the social relevance of science. Thank you. Interesting. So, so far we have a set of challenges kind of set forth by Tim and potentially some solutions to some of those challenges set forth by, by Fernando. We'll see how you guys feel that the two align. Uh, let's move on to Ibrahim, please. Uh, yeah, thanks again. Uh, you know, uh, I was trying to reflect on this, uh, on the base of the UNESCO declaration and, uh, and uh, the open science movement. Uh, and it seems to me that, you know, uh, any new developments, however well framed, uh, sometimes come around with new challenges. Uh, if you look at the framing of, of UNESCO on, 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 on open science, uh, however well meaning it is, uh, UNESCO is not, is not a nation state. Uh, sometimes it's limited 
to the extent in which it can impose uh, some of these declarations. Uh, the fact is that uh, member, member countries uh, have other interests that they want to pursue and uh, some of these interests are uh, commercial, some of them are uh, political, and uh, they often run against the kind of ambitions uh, that open science and uh, open access uh, want to achieve. Now, in terms of Africa, and, uh, and speaking from the institution that I represent here, uh, it seems to me that these challenges are actually an opportunity to rethink our position going forward and, uh, and, uh, and to engage in the kind of work that Kodesi has been trying to engage in uh, over the decades that it has existed. And that is how best we can, uh, we can insert African voices, African intellectual voices in global discussions about science. I do not think that uh, uh, for the open access movement, and, 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 and the idea of uh, open science uh, should encourage some kind of brain investment from African institutions uh, just because they are struck, just because most institutions do not have uh, publication outlets, uh, just because most institutions do not have funding for research. But I think uh, it is, it is, it, it, it is an opportunity for us to rethink the way forward. And I'm, try, I'm going to frame uh, about four trails in which uh, uh, this further thinking uh, can be engaged with going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and first of all, is the who. There we go. Sorry, guys. Looks like we had a little technical snag there, if you don't mind saying that again. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to say that, uh, you know, uh, we have now an opportunity. Uh, to rethink uh, uh, how knowledge is produced in Africa and how it is inserted uh, in global debates. And I was trying to frame four ways in which this rethinking uh, can take place. First of all, is the whole idea of uh, uh, citizen, citizen science. And we have come from a regime uh, where, where a large majority of, uh, of, uh, of Africans, if I may say so, uh, is kind of excluded uh, from the frameworks that determine how knowledge is produced. Uh, and the reasons that are given for this is because maybe of issues of language, uh, people are poor, and people think that, uh, you know, poor people cannot produce knowledge, uh, and, and, and funding models uh, that limit researchers to the extent that they can engage a more proactively uh, you know, with African citizens across the board in terms of how knowledge is to be produced. But I think that if we have to, we have to play by the spirit of the uh, UNESCO declaration, then we have an opportunity uh, to make sure that the prevailing funding mandates uh, do not reach uh, researchers in terms of engaging uh, with citizens across the board. Uh, in terms of uh, producing knowledge, because uh, we can't just we cannot just emphasize on how to uh, you know communicate knowledge without first addressing inequalities in how that knowledge is produced. The second way in which I think uh, this sharing has been taken as an opportunity is in terms of funding. Again, uh, we have uh, you know a situation in most of Africa uh, where most funding for research is external. Uh, African governments barely fund uh, research enough, and even when they have made commitments to uh, having 1% of their GDP uh, committed to research, this has not been the case. Uh, of course, reasons for this are, you know, very broad. Uh, Africans have resources, uh, but sometimes they do not receive a fair return uh, for these resources because of, you know, uh, the global dynamics. Uh, of how trade is conducted. And uh, I was thinking if, for example, uh, the global community is committed to open science, if it can only help Africa stem a risk cut off roles, then Africa should have enough resources to fund uh, its science in an equitable basis with other developing countries without uh, necessarily 
having to depend on the penovrance uh, of the West. The third way in which I look at this as an opportunity is in terms of the language of science. And uh, a lot has been said in terms of how we need to colonize science in Africa. Uh, not only in terms of content, which I've mentioned in terms of, you know, uh, engaging with communities across the world, uh, but again, the language through which science is communicated and science is presented. Again, we have a situation where, uh, you know, the channels that we have, uh, the academic literature that we have, uh, is in languages where a large percentage of citizens of the continent cannot understand, uh, which we means it's just a read what a program in this knowledge for them. So I think going forward, we will need therefore to think, as an opportunity to think quite broadly, if we are going to insert African voices into global science debates, how do we uh, use the language that can be understood by the majority of Africans? The thirdly, in terms of the discussions we have had about, uh, you know, open access, I think that African academics are confronted with uh, a situation which is uh, really uh, a no-win situation. Uh, on the one hand, uh, some of the best journals where Africans, African academics may want to publish in, uh, even if they say they are open access, uh, have implemented uh, ABC models uh, that cost more than uh, most African academics uh, can afford. And I was glad that uh, you know the keynote speaker raised this uh, in, in his address. But the second alternative that they have uh, is to look for low price, uh, you know, outlets, uh, which is not sufficiently really disseminate the kind of knowledge uh, that has been produced in Africa, and which then ends uh, making people, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, conclude that there is no good knowledge that's coming from the continent, when actually that's a function of you know, the platforms through which this knowledge uh, is, is, is disseminated. And the third option they have, of course, uh, which uh, is, is, a, is a source of concern, is where a number of African universities and academics have, uh, you know, uh, designed their own platforms uh, where they publish uh, what they see as uh, open access content. Uh, but, you know, there have been a lot of concerns that have been raised about this, uh, you know, the kind of content so poor quality is and sometimes some of this general generalization did not actually present a very correct picture of what's happening in the ground. Uh, the truth is most African academics want to publish. Sometimes they do not have sufficient outlets. Uh, working at Potestry, I know we see so many manuscripts that we cannot publish. And they are of very high quality, but this must cannot be accepted in, in, in other journals that are published outside the continent. So people are left with no alternative other than starting their own pro, uh, you know, uh, platforms for publication. But what then happens when a generalized observation is made uh, that uh, you know most of these uh, you know journals are virtually? So there is an opportunity, just because open access is still evolving, uh, there is an opportunity to try and uh, you know, address some of the limitations uh, that open access uh, places in terms of disseminating and inserting knowledge produced in Africa uh, in a group of debates, making sure uh, that we have an acceptable access policy for Africans also to publish their work in what are looked as uh, high impact journals. And fourthly, I think that we have now an opportunity to think uh, past inequalities uh, in terms of how knowledge has been produced and procured uh, with some sense of fairness and just, uh, I mean, if the status quo is maintained, and as I said from the beginning, new developments come, we can talk about open science, about open access, uh, but they are still inherent in qualities that are important. And if these are not addressed, uh, then I think we will, you know, we will get to another phase uh, where the spirit of the declaration is not uh, is is not carried. I think the challenge is on how to rescue the good ambitions of both open science and the open access uh, from uh, some trends of global politics uh, of globalization. Uh, you know, 
of commercializing uh, knowledge production and dissemination uh, and of regionalizing science, especially uh, in the case of Africa. I think that we have an opportunity to divine uh, and shape, shape science in ways uh, that are more inclusive than uh, has been uh, has been in, in the past. I think I will stop here and come back again. Hello. Hello. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you lose, did you lose me at some point? Oh, uh, it went in and out um, a, a couple times. Um, yes. I think I think we caught everything. We got all your four points. All right. All right. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, so from Ibrahim, we've got um, some some great opportunities to help um, elevate and and insert African knowledge into the global um, scene, but a couple of, of very specific barriers there as well. So, um, so other other speakers, you prepare your your reactions for the discussion once uh, once Susie um, has done speaking. So, um, Susan, may I hand it over to you? Well, I I am honored to follow such wisdom and perspective. Thank you. Um, from BioOne's perspective, I heard many words from the four of you, or three of you, sorry, <laughs> who that resonated. Economies of scale is a thing, is an issue that really does something we work with a lot. It is uh, it's a goal, and it's always difficult to get that. Um, in terms of a subscription package, I'm going to contrast Bio One Complete, which is subscribed, with Bio One Open Access, which is obviously open access. But in terms of a subscription package, Bio One Complete is in sync with an academic community's needs. In other words, the greatest concerns are the ones we attempt to meet, which are quality of contents, reliable delivery, availability, and a sustainable business model. With regard to the collection as a whole, less than 2% of the articles in Bio One, in Bio One Complete, that is, are subject to the Plan S mandate. That means that there's very little room from, uh, very little money from foundations, governments, institutions, et cetera, to support open access, the open access publication model. Nonetheless, as I said earlier, Bio One does support green and gold open access. Um, editors in the subscribe collection are encouraged to make a certain percentage of their volumes green or gold, also known as free. And they may still earn royalties based on the hits and the pages in those particular um, publications. Bio One is experimental to the core. I alluded to earlier, we've tried lots of different things, and uh, you might think of the walls as spaghetti on it, trying to stick. We worked on some innovative projects to cut the overhead and to align more closely, even more closely, with the academic pocketbooks, which are growing smaller and smaller, as we all know. One idea that was very much ahead of itself when we launched it is Elemento Science of the Anthropocene, which is a, still exists. It is not owned by Bio One anymore. It was a publication, an open access publication, in gold, that we um, launched in 2013. The ideas began before that and the planning, and we held it through 2007 until 2017. We invested five million dollars of Bio One's money in that. That's our capital as well as our operating fund. What we found, we learned lots of lessons. We found that the infrastructure, which is another word I heard from my colleagues earlier, infrastructure limited our ability to scale. 
simply has to be a means of cutting the costs on infrastructure and the market, meaning enough people who are interested in adopting this particular technology and business model. I'm happy to say that Elementa is still thriving at the University of California Press. In terms of uh, just the, the perspectives on the global view, BioOne responds to the needs of small to mid-sized publishers who prefer to retain control of their own business and generally do not have large budgets. They would, many would like, I'm not speaking for all of them, many would like to have open access. As we've been speaking earlier, however, and I think anyone else listening will agree that open access is simply not free. Someone has to pay somewhere. And this is something that uh, we all grapple with. BioOne is now exploring how we might provide greater support to those in the community who wish to adopt an open access business model. Not all of our publishers have expressed an interest, however. And um, it's not our business to proselytize either, but we want to make things, we want to make the capabilities available. One way that we might develop uh, uh, less uh, opportunities would be to provide a less expensive set of tools that supports the entire set of submissions to editorial and financial needs. This is something I think, Tim, you're grappling with as well. Um, our lessons from Elementa, however, are that we need to determine first and foremost whether there is sufficient demand to create the necessary economies of scale. Just a, a quick note on our non, uh, just in terms of where funding comes from in our community, non-US authors have the greatest access to governmental and university support for open access for the kinds of titles that we have in Bio One. I'm not saying there's a great deal of money, it's just that that's where the, the money resides in, in central places. But those that publish open access with Bio One, the sources run the gamut and not a, there isn't a single kind that dominates. Research grants, government subsidies, library funding, society endowments, APCs, those fossils from your page charges, donations, in-kind contributions, and not least, the pockets of the researchers themselves. These are the many ways that our authors have attempted to provide access and serving all all the needs of everybody is is a big uh, a big bite to chew on and I, I Tim is nodding <laughs> I can see I'd like to as the last one to speak for this particular session I'd like to thank Jen and Leslie and Bernie and my esteemed colleagues for putting the putting this on and for your challenges. Thank you so much, Susie. More to come, stand by. Um, so we've got uh, we've got half an hour now, and uh, we do have some some questions coming in. But um, you know, as kind of representatives from these these different communities and and regions, um, and and have given the chance to hear from from your colleagues on the panel, um, would it be alright to ask you to to just kind of react, each of you, Tim? Tim, could I start with you again? You know, you um, to, for your talk, you outlined some of the some of the, the challenges that you were facing, and now you, you've heard perspectives from. Um, from other communities, do any solutions or opportunities leap out or, or, or commonalities? Yeah, just the first thought that comes to my head is um, around, and I think it's one of the questions on the board too, around APCs and um, what we're found, 
finding, we did a, a study of the Canadian journal landscape and there's about 100, 825 journals in, in Canada. They're published in Canada and only, I'm trying to find my note here, but um, uh, there's only about 5% of them that publish with, with the big five journals and only a, a couple percent of them charge APCs. So I think the, the federal funding that that we've provided, we've provided it since the 40s. It's one of these perennial programs that uh, that the government's had, I guess. Um, I think that's made a difference in terms of the viability of a lot of journals to be able to get by. Uh, admittedly, as Susan said, this is not a lot of money. So our study found that in Canadian dollars, we're looking, which is which is close to U.S. dollars. It's it's around. 40 to 80 K per year that they're, they're getting by on. So it's mostly volunteer time, that type of thing. So, but they've been able to get by on some small scale funding without charging APCs. Cause I, I take the point Ibrahim's raising and, 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 um, uh, and we heard it earlier today about APCs as a barrier to, well, to anyone in the world without, without, uh, let's say a research grant to be able to pay for that APC. So, so, um, uh, as a first, kind of thought in terms of solutions, I do think that across disciplines, um, federal funders should look at direct program support to journals, not just through, let's say, funding researchers to fund, to who would then support open access through APCs. Great, thanks. I want to open it up now. You know, Fernanda, Ibrahim, Susie, do you have uh, reactions? Do you want to jump in? Ibrahim? Yeah, I think if I can come in, uh, you know, the challenge within the continent, within Africa, you know, the discussions about open access uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe and North America uh, and, uh, and in Africa kind of take different trajectories. Uh, in, uh, in North America and Europe, uh, you have acceptable knowledge that has been produced from, uh, you know, within local ecosystems that of, uh, are sufficiently funded. Uh, and therefore, the challenge is on how to take it out in ways that most people can access it. In Africa, the challenge is twofold. First of all, we need to put, to, to establish a local knowledge production and dissemination ecosystem before we even start thinking how we uh, make this knowledge uh, accessible uh, to everybody across the board. Uh, so we, we, we have the challenge is twofold. And uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, we have been discussing is because the institution that I work in, uh, we get almost 99.9% .9 of our funding from external sources. And uh, we are kind of rugged that they do not, uh, you know, they give us a free hand in terms of how we spend this money, uh, you know, training such as producing knowledge and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, disseminating it freely uh, to African institutions. So in that sense, we are like, uh, but this funding is never enough. And um, in a lot of other instances, the standard funding that comes from African institutions is associated with uh, certain uh, limitations uh, that the knowledge produced does not end up representing, uh, you know, what we can call as a real African science uh, that can compete with global discourses on what good science or bad science is. Uh, so, so, so we have that dilemma. So the first thing is how do we balance uh, that benevolence uh, with some level of scientific sovereignty. And one of the things that we have been discussing is should African governments uh, raise a tax, for example, multinational companies, on telecommunication companies that operate in Africa, and they use this money uh, to support research and building more strong knowledge ecosystems that can compete globally. Now, if we do not make recourse to this, then most of the, these declarations, including what the African Union Commission says, just remain on paper because institutions will remain under, underfunded. And the African academics will be flooded from knowledge that has been produced elsewhere, uh, but that then which does not really 
is not totally relevant to the kind of needs uh, that the continent the continent. So I, I think it, it's more, uh, you know, a group of uh, socio-political dilemma that we have uh, with multinational history, like the, the, communi the communication companies that are making a lot of profits in the continent. The mining companies that have been involved in uh, tax evasion and all that. If we have the tax on these companies, it should be able to build a number of uh, knowledge generation and the knowledge dissemination hubs across the continent where it can equally compete with what's happening uh, elsewhere in the world. Interesting. Thank you. Maybe if, if I can jump in. Yes, please. Uh, well, I, I think that it, from all I've heard from, from the colleagues in the panel, with Tim, we have a very similar landscape, I mean, in, in what you described about the Canadian journals. In Latin America, we have about 7,000 journals. Unfortunately, we don't have the general absolute picture empirically because we're working on that. We don't have like interoperable databases uh, to, to have this uh, general picture, but we're working on this and, and we've um, already made, uh, made some important studies, I think, in on Cielo, Redalic, and Latindex, but this is not really easy because they, they do not work in a, in a one integrated database or infrastructure. But of all these 7,000 journals, only the 2% of them are belong to the big publishers. And uh, we could say that very few charge APC because of the total 7,000 journals, only 5% of them are charging APC. But this is especially concentrated in Brazil, where the 10% of the Cielo collection charges APC. And also we have a, an increase in amount of journals that are charging APC and that are editing in English. The, the, the increase of the English publishing in Brazil is very consistent. And so if I compare with Argentina, where I knew exactly the, the 800 journals that we have, it's very similar to the Canadian amount of journals. I would like to put here into the discussion the recent report from uh, Opera on, on the Diamond Journals, because, well, I think that we should discuss the, the idea in this report, in this wonderful report that uh, makes us all think that the diamond journals are journals uh, made out of volunteering because it's like the volunteering would be uh, I don't know three or four persons that do not belong even to a university that decide to make a journal and I think mostly we have the diamond journals are or either published by a scientific society or by a university if they are published by university, like the major part of the journals in Latin America, they are headed by an editor and by a scientific committee made up with professors. And these professors are mostly full-time professors. If not, this wouldn't be possible. So sometimes the support they are needing is very scarce in terms of funds. I mean, uh, they, they need, uh, as you said, Tim, federal funds that come directly to for uh, OGS or for um, to, to make possible the DOI for each one of these items. You know, it's like the, the processing of, of the um, evaluation process and all. And I think that this is what we are needing, along with uh, inserting the, the possibility of the editing uh, practice and the editing work as a relevant thing for evaluation, because these uh, professors that uh, are working in a journal do not really receive, um, they're, they're not uh, valued in their evaluation for tenure, for tenure, for promotion. These practices become a volunteering practice because nobody recognizes that. Either, I mean, of course, us reading the journals and, and authors, of course, but not in the system. And so I think research assessment should include uh, editing uh, practices as a part of the very important uh, assessment processes. Thank you. Susan? Uh, yeah, I, I was I had a question for my colleagues here. And I think that, Fernanda, you were touching on this earlier. And perhaps it's an issue that's that's bigger than I'm aware of, but uh, I'm wondering to the, the extent to which an open access journal is considered um, 
shall we say, competitive or of the same quality as other journals for when, it, when an author wants to submit a paper. Will an author look at the business model or will the author look at the supporting publisher? I don't know, Jennifer, if you want me to answer. Yes. Well, I think we face a, a huge problem there in your question, but I wouldn't phrase it as, as if the difference is an open access journal and a non-open uh, access or subscription journal or closed journal. Because we, in the open access journals, we have a very different situation if they belong to the, the commercial databases that, uh, for example, Scopus or World of Science, and to belong to the system that uh, that uh, counts the, the citations of these index in, in a journal rank. That is the big difference, because if the evaluation systems in our countries keep on evaluating people through the impact factor, well, it doesn't matter if it's open access or not. I mean, what people, well, I mean, People really in, in, in our countries, in Latin America, they highly value open access. But if they want uh, to publish in, in, in a journal, the first thing they're looking for is to have a, um, a reward in their promotions or in tenure. And uh, if they feel that the, the journals that are going to circulate more, because this is the feeling, are the ones that have the, the highest impact factor, they're going to publish in those. And so there's a lot of things with things we have to think of, about again. I mean, the abuses of the of the impact factor in university rankings and in the assessment systems are really in the, I think, in the bottom of the problem for all of us. Uh, and that's something we, we should all have to solve here. That's actually good news. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's take some questions um, from the floor, shall we? Um, the good news is that the, we're in one live Zoom event um, for a few hours, so if we don't get to the questions right away, I encourage the, our panelists and, and participants to stick around for, for discussion between sessions. So, um, so Angelina Zanesco, um, I don't understand your question, I'm afraid. Could you just rephrase it for me, um, and then, then I'll try and get to it. I'm going to move to, to Micah Vandergrift, um, who's asking about bibliodiversity. So, uh, any of the panelists who wants to to respond, um, could you briefly imagine um, out loud what a bibliodiverse research infrastructure would look like, and what might be different from what we all know and and see right now? By bibliodiverse, are we talking about language? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and books, I think. <laughs> Oh, so including books in the mix rather than yeah, just so let's say, yeah, all yeah, let's so um all uh, scholarship um available in, in different languages. So so Tim, um in in Canada, uh, we've got two official languages. So is this is this something that you that you have to tra traverse fairly regularly? Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a good question. I think there's um there's incredible pressure um and you hear it especially from the francophone community to to that is absorbing scholarship and pressing scholarship toward the kind of global english and uh so there's probably a danger there uh where francophone scholars for instance in canada don't feel that they they can always pub publish in the language of their choice you know maybe to the extent uh that would be ideal but that being said um we still have uh 41% of, I said there's about 800 journals, about 41% of those are bilingual and 11% and are strictly francophone. So, so that, that, um, uh, I, I think gets to part of the bibliodiversity that we're looking for. I think the other would be we have, a uh, uh, indigenous and regional studies, th those types of things that speak to, let's say, specificities of areas of Canada or Canadian interest that are less likely to be again something that uh, would would need to speak to a, an international and, and let's say a commercial market that would, would 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 generate subscription sales around the globe so so in a way those kind of diversity helps um 
helps ensure openness to, to some extent and and openness can provide a space for those those diverse for, uh, voices in terms of I guess the question about what a really diverse research infrastructure could could look like I think um, you know there's I, I think we start we're starting to see uh, as Fernando was mentioning those types of regional infrastructures and I, I don't want to you know, Canada's got got um, you know coalition public, like I was saying. But of course, there's uh, the CLO that Fernanda mentioned, uh, Open Edition. So these these types of uh, national infrastructures that have various levels of institutional and government support, I think, are are what I see as strong strong examples of where where that should go in the future. Um, may I just add to that? one at first was um, English only. And this was a financial uh, consideration actually because adding other languages or supporting other languages is, is more expensive. Over time, however, we found that uh, there is a greater need. Not, not that we didn't know that, it's just that uh, we've been, the technology has improved such that we can add other languages Unfortunately, these have to be languages written in uh, the the Greek alphabet, if you will, and the, and the alphabet, as opposed to say Hebrew or Chinese or Sanskrit or Hindi, whatever. Um, simply because we cannot uh, we cannot afford to support these other languages that are extremely expensive to do, and nor can we be responsible for any kind of quality control as much as we'd like to do that. I think that going forward, supporting other languages is going to be critical. And there's got to be a way, not necessarily Google Translate, but right now that's what we have, that will allow us all to get at the information that people are sharing in ways that they can understand. And perhaps it will be technology that's going to make the difference for us. Now, Please. Yeah. Uh, what we have been doing uh, in the council and uh, as a commitment of its founding principles is to operate in at least four languages, uh, French, English, Arabic. And uh, we try to translate uh, some publications that we think are key into all of these languages. Uh, it's expensive, uh, but it's uh, again a mandate that we, we, we can't run away from. So we invest quite a lot of resources uh, in translating some works. And then making sure that uh, all our, you know, conferences, uh, workshops, and uh, you know, training institutes uh, are also conducted in multiple languages. So we try to invest a lot of resources, uh, just because we thought that we should uh, enhance the capacity of American academics to, uh, you know, to engage among themselves. Uh, the challenge we have, and uh, and uh, what we are ashamed of, is that we have not been able uh, to engage in any major African language. Uh, and the discussion has been how do we start publishing work, at least in one or two African languages uh, that are widely spoken across the continent. I know that some advances have been made in South Africa. Uh, some universities now are even allowing their students, uh, you know, write their PhD dissertations in any of the local languages that have been classified as, uh, as official. Uh, and we think that that's a good start. Uh, we know that across the continent now, a number of countries are picking up Swahili uh, as a kind of lingua franca. In fact, South Africa has gone ahead to have Swahili uh, start being taught in, in, in their schools. Uh, and we think that it is a first move. Uh, so what we should do as a research council and uh, what other African universities and research centers should do, I think, is to uh, try and uh, include at least one African language. Uh, in the kind of uh, intellectual work that they do, and in the publications that, that come out, and in the manner in which these works are disseminated. Thank you. Fernanda, I propose to move to another question. 
if that's all right. And we'll get one more question in, and then um, I'd like to ask for a closing remark from, from each of you um, before, before we close the call. So, um, so the next question on the list um, is, is whether you believe um, there is a way to actually get to a fully OA world or whether this is impossible. Fernando, may I start with you? I didn't understand what you said. Fully what? World? <laughs> open access. Oh, okay. The open access world is is achievable. Okay, you said OA. Okay. I didn't understand that. Well, you. I think we are facing like a, a how do you say this in English? Like a hinge now because open access is really moving very fast, particularly after the Plan S, and I think this is really moving very fast in the north and in this commercial path. Uh, on the idea of, of uh, the read and publish agreements or the ABC, this is moving very fast. But um, I think that we're not going to find an OA world, but an OA, OA small little world, which would be the, this uh, publishing that comes from the north or uh, the, the, um, the sector of the academic world that can publish in these journals. So I think that uh, in order to advance to a really global uh, open access world, we need to to um, to make a conjunction of ex efforts from the academic journals, and uh, in some way, I would say, like uh, to, to trying to to watch in a distance the publishing model from the big publishers. I mean, from the really academic uh, uh, led journals and the, the journals from the universities. And uh, all these infrastructures that are starting to be to create in, in, in our universities and our countries, such as the current research information systems, because I think that these new generation repositories are the ones that have to build from bottom down up <laughs> the, the visibility of the different formats, different languages, and that's the only way. But journals have a very, very uh, critical role here because we cannot put on the infrastructure or, or, or the open access or open science infrastructures anything that we have. I mean, peer review is the key to, to, to quality of science. And so I think that we have all a role to, to play here. But I really am confident that the new rep repositories are, are the path. Uh, according with, uh, I mean, in, in, a, in a connection, of course, with the efforts made by the journals and the editors. Thanks, Fernanda. Other reactions? Tim, Ibrahim, Susie? Can we achieve? Yeah, I mean, if I may, if I may say something. You know, I, I, I do not think that, uh, you know, it is possible to end up with that ideal position where we have real open access. Uh, at any point in time. I think that even some of the best ideas in search have never been achieved 100%. Uh, they get some praise and maybe uh, in the process, uh, they yield ground to another idea which claims uh, that, uh, you know, that it will push the process. The idea behind uh, open access to make sure that uh, uh, everybody else accesses the benefits of, uh, of, of, of research or the knowledge that has been produced. And, and maybe if we get to a point in time where commercial interests do not allow total open access, I'm optimistic that another idea will come that will try to take this approach forward. But I do not think that we, even, even the very best ideas like democracy have been achieved totally across the world. Uh, they have had their benefits, and open science is going to have its benefits. Uh, but I do not think, uh, given the trends and the, and the, and the, the divergent interests from the different stakeholders, I do not think that we will end up in an ideal system of total open access at any point in time. Tim or Susie, Tim? Yeah, I'll, I'll just concur quickly with the, with the panelists. I think it, it's a I like I like the way the question was phrased too. You know, let's be honest, we're not we're not going to have a a fully open access world. I think that would be idealistic. Um, I think uh, as as you know, we have to as a couple of people mentioned, there there are costs to publishing and and really kind of to me what I see open access and discussions around it aiming at is ensuring that costs that in a traditional model are borne by uh, libraries or at the reader end 
um, and then excluded some many readers or most readers are are distributed in the system differently in a way that's efficient and effective, right? So, so even subscribe to open models still have a cost to bear for some readers, and so those those costs are just distributed differently. And then, as we've already mentioned, you know, a, APC models where the costs are are born at the front end are still it's a, it's an issue because not everyone can afford the front end. So, so uh, I guess uh, um, a, a world where we have kind of uh, uh, market mechanisms for for distributing the costs in such a way where we we do find those efficiencies in the system is what we can aim for. A diverse uh, diverse publishing models that uh, can experiment in that landscape and try to find uh, where the sweet spot is. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, Amazon's still around, right? Like Amazon's, I think I, last time I checked, is doing fairly well, right? Selling <laughs> selling books among other things, right? So there's there's a very very blurry spectrum between this OA for scholarly publications and where people are still willing to spend a lot of money for books and and, and that type of thing. So so uh, and and that's kind of what, as I said, when here in Canada we were trying to what we were coming up against when we were trying to look at whether or not we could move more monographs to open because there's still with with these with these uh, presses still a marketability for uh for for commercial sales for a lot of those monographs so so all that to say yeah it, it i don't see a, a world where we're fully open in the future but if we can uh, continue to make progress on 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 lowering costs and, and distributing them properly i think that's the goal thanks Jim. susie and here i thought i was going to be drawn and quartered and tarred and feathered for saying that i do not believe that there is a, it is possible to go fully open access. That said, one of the problems that, that brought about open access is the fact that the pricing has not matched the needs of the academic community. As the academic community has contracted and we're not building more, we're not growing more students right now in the world and costs are just going through the roof for everything lumber included uh, it's hard to imagine that it will be possible to continue with serving the, the needs of the academy unless we are able to do it within their own budget so when the good old days before 19 what 1995 roughly there were many publications that were being sold as a subscription that served the needs of the of the academy thus i don't think that uh, that model will necessarily go away it certainly works for smaller to mid-sized publications um, open access is something that is i think i've learned from today's discussion it, it actually meets the needs of certain parts of the population around the world because it costs and we can't make everything free no matter how charitable we want to be we still have to keep the lights on so until and i would agree with anyone everyone here that we have we need to make room for reasonable ways of providing scholarly information and to communicate amongst uh, facilitate communication amongst scholars in ways that really are um, not impeding not being impeded by the size of one's wallet or the lack of a credit card that kind of thing thanks Susie all right, we we had better um, wrap up here. Um, we're oh, we're at time now, so um, I'd like to encourage everyone to join the the Slack channel for this session um, to carry on the, uh, the discussion. Please restate your questions there so our, our panelists can um, can weigh in. Um, there there's 
it's impossible really to try and and, and capture the breadth of, of all of the ground that that we've just covered. But I think there are some some really important opportunities and and learnings from from different corners. So um, Ibrahim talking about the the importance of first kind of mastering knowledge uh, uh, capture and and dissemination in Africa, helping it to reach the the, the global scale and and be effectively inserted. Um, and and Tim talking about the the struggles of of researcher engagement and and changing cultures to get researchers in, in engaged with with funder policies, um, and uh, Fernando reminding us of success in in Norway and how um, this you know shared infrastructures and repositories have created context to incentivize researchers and 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 change up some of the the models that that can limit us in other fora and and Susie you know helping us to understand the the differences and challenges between disciplines and how how even open access is going to progress at, at different different rates in different communities. So we are all we're all in different different places. So um, what I've taken away from today's discussion are several ideas about how we can kind of reach around the globe to support one another, to learn from one another, and uh, and and hopefully make one another's um, community stronger. So thank you very much to all of our panelists um, for, for joining us today. Thank you so much to my colleague, Leslie, um, who um, did uh, unspeakable amounts of work to pull this together. And, uh, and please, everyone, reach out to one another and, and let's carry on this conversation um, in the real and, uh, and make, it, uh, make it practical. Thank you. And I guess we're going to break now and I will resume in about uh, 14 minutes.